interestingly, if you look closely at the fine print on the article, I think it was in Lancet Oncology, it lists obviously not a survival curve since we only have relapse free survival, but it lists number of deaths over time. And at every point in time, there are fewer deaths on the IPI arm by a fair margin than on the placebo arm. It leads you to believe that at ESMO in October, we're going to hear, we, by the way, we will hear about the survival uh, data, and it would lead you to believe it's going to be favorable. Now, how favorable it's going to be, I don't know what that hazard ratio. Will it go below the magic 0.75? I don't know, but um, it interests me that you say that most Australian oncologists would not be using IPI. I feel more comfortable using adjuvant ipilimumab, certainly more comfortable than um, using adjuvant interferon. Each one has its own type of toxicities. So I think that's the key, because adjuvant interferon is not actually well taken up in many countries around the world, given the very low risk benefit. I don't think it's taken up in any country around the world. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, just, not uh, just, even the in US. Terms of, not just in terms of your comparison. But um, it'll be interesting. And the only other thing to say about the overall survival is that we now have a lot of treatments. And when, Ipilumum, when that study was accrued, we didn't. So what the data you're quoting, which we probably shouldn't discuss because it's only just deaths, it's not hazard ratios, it's not proper analysis, um, is in a time where we probably didn't have much to treat patients with when they recur. Well, you can discuss it. You may not. You have to be careful how you interpret it. Exactly. You I would. I would not be using that. Let's go to a tiebreaker. So, Jason, yeah. <laughs> you, you, you know, we have, in the U.S. We do have patients right. walk into our office. Um, you know, three A up through three C. Um, you know, maybe at those ends of the spectrum, even. Uh, you know, how do you think about, how do you present the, yeah. you know, I mean, how do you, so how do you summarize I, the toxicity and then, you know, this, this uh, anguished choice about efficacy? This is the toughest issue right now in melanoma medical oncology, what to do with stage three patients. And this consult takes an hour every single time. Um, I actually fall much closer to Georgina than to Jeff. Um, I think that I, despite whether or not there will be a benefit, the toxicity trade-off, I think, is, is hard. And so in my practice, I, I would say I would, I would almost never treat a patient who is 3A, probably never 3B. A 3C starts to get pretty close to metastatic disease anyway, then you start thinking maybe so. But I am also, this is another analysis that I don't know if we should really do, but if you look at the the relapse-free survival benefit in the, in the adjuvant trial with a 25% improvement in hazard for relapse. And now we're developing this longer-term series of patients treated out. Some of them are going five years, eight years, so on and so forth. And that, that's a debatable sort of analysis because it's not really powered, it's not perspective, whatever. But that, you know, it's looking 20, 25% of patients. So now we got 25 over here. We got... And those are a little bit apples and oranges, but they're still fruit. And so um, that also makes me worried about doing something to the patient in the adjuvant setting, if there's a bad toxicity, that puts them at risk to not be a candidate for subsequent therapies that we know are highly efficacious. Yep. And so that, again, so in my practice, I tend to really not give much adjuvant mm -hmm. ipilimumab. There, is, there are ongoing trials still investigating agents say. in this space. So I, would re again, really prioritize the idea that patients yeah. should participate. But in could we explore that? What would, it, what would occur that would make an ipiadjuvant patient not a candidate for subsequent immunotherapy? If they had a high, well, it's a, it's a risk-benefit ratio at all times, right? But if you had a high-grade colitis in the adjuvant setting, um, you would, you would, you may still, you know, it's what, what the options do you have or whatever, but you would be ineligible for a clinical trial thereafter probably. If it resolves and but most trials some say no. period of time would occur, you would then be in a position to give them subsequent, you could even give them subsequent IPI up the road or pembrolizumab or nivolumab. I, and, and actually that was something discussed uh, at the poster discussion at ASCO this year. Uh, that series from Australia by uh, That was Menzies. actually international, by the way. I beg your pardon? It was actually international across the whole of U.S., some Europe, and Australia. Yeah, I guess but yet, you, you driven know, by Australia, of course. Guy collected Always. cases of patients who had had significant immune-related adverse events to checkpoint inhibitors, and he showed that, you, you know, there were at least 50, 60 patients. You could successfully retreat them without reproducing the same side effects. I've done that in a smaller series that was buried in a larger study that was just published. So I, I, I think that the sort of the myth that once you get a, a severe immune-related adverse event from one checkpoint inhibitor means you can't use another is probably that. It's not But, but let's leave the safety part aside for a moment and go, circle back to efficacy. I mean, I think you know, Jason was touching on this. So let's play it, out, play it forward a little bit. And, and let's say that we, get, we have data in a you know, year or two's time that really supports the idea that ipi-nevo combination is a superior approach with overall survival. Okay, So leave aside progression-free response rate benefits. 
Um, in stage four, you're talking. That's what I'm saying. Stage, right? stage four, yeah. So then, so then, so if you have that regimen with survival data behind it, yep. How do you feel about giving adjuvantipalumumab, with recognizing based on the emerging evidence that a fair fraction of those patients are still going to relapse? So you've you've exposed them to CTLA four, ten mg per kg. They relapse. I'm making up a number here. Two years later, do you have confidence that ipinevo is still a regimen? So you're going to reuse the CTLA four component. Do you have confidence that it's still a regimen that's going to pack? all of its punch in a patient who's been previously exposed to ipilimumab in the adjuvant setting. I think if enough time has gone by, probably. I would also say that that will be a mood point within a year or so because we'll have the relapse-free survival data from the randomized phase three IPI versus NEVO trial. And if NEVO is the winner, everyone's going to be using single-agent nivolumab as an adjuvant therapy with a very modest toxicity profile and no one will be using IPI anymore. So you're referring to the trial of stage 3B, 3C, and 4. Correct. Resected, randomized Correct. ipilimumab or nivolumab. Correct. Okay, yep, sorry. I'm, you know, I think that has a decent chance of being a positive trial, and if it is, adjuvant ipilimumab will have gone through a year or two of use and then faded, maybe not in Australia, but at least in the U.S., and faded out. And then we'll think about, could you drop the dose of IPI and keep the NEVO and use combination therapy as an adjuvant? All right, now you're getting, now you're getting <laughs> way out of the future. I think that just again, like to bring it back, just emphasize how complicated this decision is yeah, for yeah. patients and physicians. Yeah, yeah. And I would, again, strongly emphasize that there are trials ongoing that we just really don't know the answer here, and it's really important that people continue to participate. May I make one comment on the trials that are ongoing? Because some of them will answer that question that we're struggling with. For example, the EORTC trial of stage three resected, patients are randomized to placebo or pembrolizumab, and patients who relapse on the placebo are allowed to cross over to pembrolizumab. So it will be very interesting, to, and it's, it's powered for survival as well as relapse-free survival, primary endpoints, relapse-free survival. But it'll be very interesting to see whether you still see an overall survival benefit after you've crossed over, because if you don't, then it tells you, well, just wait till people have stage four. Don't give 50% of people drug up front. Wait till they have stage four because you're going to have the same effect.